Hello and welcome to episode 234 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. As always, joined by Evan Silva, and it is almost final exam time. Most fantasy drafts will take place over the next seven to 10 days. People are cramming for us. It's a culmination of about six months of work. Evan, how's it going? Going great. Had a, a live event with three live drafts in the Chicago area last night. We had a great turnout. Um, people had a blast, I think, and uh, you know, got to meet a lot of a lot of established to run subscribers. Ho- hopefully, some of the people that weren't already uh, listeners are, are now going to be listeners and subscribers. But uh, shout out to everybody that showed up. And uh, now we're going to get to some round by round analysis. I think this is a show that people like every year. Yeah, again, as Evan said, on today's show, we're going to have some fun. Each year, we go round by round discussing our favorite targets in each kind of range. That is what we will do today. Before we get into that, our draft kit is now overflowing with what you need to win your draft. All our rankings, including Silva's Top 150, update constantly with the news and usage, what we think is important. How to draft from your position, abusing the default rankings, favorite flyers, Silva sleepers and busts, lots more. It's all in there. If you have enjoyed the nearly, I don't even know, 100 free pods we've done this offseason and this summer, we'd appreciate you considering our draft kit at $34.99. think you guys realize we're not out here shilling a ton. We're not trying to squeeze out every dollar. We're just a small team of people who really do put a ton of effort into trying to provide you guys with max value and make the highest quality products available. And honestly, hope you stick with us during the regular season where we really ramp up the intensity for the great game of DFS. Again. Email support at establishrun.com if you already have the draft kit and want to turn it into the bundle. Lastly, before we get started here, best ball season is almost over. Last chance to take underdogs free money. If you already have the draft kit, be sure you got the free money. Go to the best ball tab on the site and click on how to claim underdog credit. Follow the instructions there. All right, let's get into it with round by round. Note that these rounds are not going to be exact. Like every draft room is going to be different. Every format is different. We tried our best to guess where these guys will be available in home type leagues. It's not going to be exact. Don't send messages to me and Evan saying like, oh, that guy was going to go in the fourth round. You said he was available in the third. Like we can't predict where the ADP is going to be in every single room. Tried to do that a little bit with abusing the default rankings, but some leagues are tougher. Some leagues are softer. We've seen that throughout the offseason in different formats. I mean, if you go back and watch our 1900 league, there was some ADP in there I never would have guessed. There was guys were going in rounds I never would have guessed. It was crazy. So take it easy on us on the round by rounds and where guys are. Let's start with round one, Evan. I think everybody wants the number one pick. What do you have for your optimal target in round one? Yeah, well, I went with uh, two guys here because, you know, you – if you're drafting at the end of the first round or drafting at the beginning of the first round, you definitely want Christian McCaffrey. If you're drafting toward the end of the first round, sort of an arbitrage Christian McCaffrey in Austin Eckler, I think that the Chargers offense is worth betting on. No, I don't think that they're going to lead the NFL in plays run again this year, but I do think that they are going to be highly efficient. Their offensive line is significantly improved. They're going to score a lot of touchdowns. They have so many stylistically complementary players players in their skill position core, whether it be, you know, the, the target magnet in Keenan Allen or you know, the big clasher in Mike Williams or these speed guys that they've got in Jalen Guyton and Josh Palmer and uh, Tyron Johnson. And, um, and Austin Eckler is a guy who's going to be out there a ton. Joe Lombardi, their new offensive coordinator has already compared him and his usage to Austin Eckler, uh, to Alvin Kamara, uh, with whom Joe Lombardi has spent the, this past several years on Sean Payton's staff in New Orleans. So I think that Austin Eckler is a high floor, high upside play with a chance to catch 90 balls. Yeah, I, and I certainly like that one. Always want to bet on Austin Eckler. We talked to Thorne about the Chargers offensive line. As Evan mentioned, I mean, massive improvements on the offensive line for the Los Angeles Chargers, I think makes a difference. Year two of Justin Herbert. I think will be one to watch. Obviously, I think if you can make trades, if you can do whatever you have to to get up to the 1.1 and take Christian McCaffrey, I think it is worth 
considering you can see in our auction values on the site how much higher we have Christian McCaffrey talk to Chris Eibel about how much uh, during the auction stuff about how much more Christian McCaffrey is worth than every other guy if you can't get Christian McCaffrey I don't think it's bad to take one of the wide receivers in the later part of the first round Devontae Adams Tyree Kill Steph Diggs whichever one falls to you it sets us up because we have some nice round two running back options, which we'll talk about here in a second, but by solidifying and not to really not finding a floor, uh, these guys just have Devontae, Tyreek, Diggs. They're just not going to fail. Let's go to round two. We'll get to more interesting stuff as we go along here. Round two, Evan, who do you have? I have DK Metcalf, and I think it always surprises me a little bit how far into the second round DK Metcalf consistently falls because I think that this player – absolutely is a candidate to lead the NFL in receiving yards and receiving touchdowns on the receiving end. The number one receiver for Russell Wilson, one of the most efficient and aggressive passers in the league. I love the Seahawks new emphasis on tempo under their first year offensive coordinator, Shane Waldron. I think that that's going to um, mitigate any loss of uh, pass attempt volume. Uh, They're going to just run more plays And DK Metcalf is an absolute beast of physical presence. He's been knock on wood healthy throughout training camp. The the target distribution in Seattle is very, very narrow. It's, you know, Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf at the top. And then just a a bunch of guys scrapping for for whatever is left over. Uh, DK Metcalf, a high floor, very high upside. He could absolutely be the overall wide receiver one this year. And you can consistently get him in the 20s. Yeah, I absolutely love it. And when you start RB in round one, coming back with DK Metcalf is really an awesome, awesome, awesome way to start your draft. Do you think DK Metcalf's route tree will be more diversified this year? I know people think he can't do it. I mean, dude is such a freak. I'm of, I'm of the belief that he can. If I go running back in round one, DK Metcalf or Calvin Ridley would be my favorite pick. Calvin Ridley is going to be one of the league leaders in air yards. There's absolutely no doubt about it. When you combine how deep he's going to run down the field with how many targets he's going to get without Julio, I really think 30% target share is in the range of outcomes for Cal Ridley. He also has a really high catch rate and his red zone catch rate and red zone target rate is actually way higher than Julio's ever was. If you end up going wide receiver in round one, round two, I like bring it back with Najee Harris. There are not many guys in the NFL who could literally touch the ball 400 times this year. I mean, it would not shock me if Najee got 370, 380 touches this year. It would not shock me in the least. And I think that's really hard to pass on. In home leagues, where I think that I have a big advantage over my opponents, the floor, the reliability of Najee's volume is more appealing to me than Antonio Gibson. In these formats where uh, all the money is up top or it's really tough and I want to introduce a little bit more variance, a little bit more ceiling, Antonio Gibson would be the guy for me where if he gets the third down roll, I mean, just go absolutely nuclear. Still think he's going to catch 40 or 50 balls even in an early down roll. All right, let's get to round three. Starts to get interesting here. Evan, who do you have in round three? So Keenan Allen is a fringe second, third round pick. He goes early in the third round. So I'm Mm -hmm. I'm cheating a little bit here, but I do think that he goes – behind where he should. So I have him as a a solidified top 24 overall player. And he usually goes in the, um, in the late twenties. And sometimes you'll see him slip into the early thirties, but, but usually in the late twenties. And again, I think it's number one, it's a situation where I'm looking at players within offenses that I want to wager on. And I want to wager on the, on the chargers offense this year. Keenan Allen has, Uh, 97 or more receptions in four straight seasons. Uh, He is uh, such a comfortable target for Justin Herbert. You know, when Justin Herbert drops back to pass and and he's looking at his receivers, Mike Williams is rarely going to be open. I mean, Mike Williams is not a receiver that comes open. Keenan Allen comes open as maybe the league's premier route runner. And that makes him such a comfortable target. And that's why last year you saw him consistently, you know, especially over the back half of the year, getting 10, 12, 14, nine targets on a weekly basis. He's a high floor. uh, He's a high floor play every uh, week. And he's also still on the right side of 30. Yep. Uh, I was going to say a guy in the same range that's on that 2-3 border, and that's C.D. Lamb, but I'll go to the back end instead, or maybe the middle, and say Terry McLaurin. Everywhere Ryan Fitzpatrick goes, he maximizes the value of his number one 
wide receiver. Ryan Fitzpatrick is willing to throw the ball into coverage, not afraid to make mistakes, a.k.a. interceptions. And Terry McLaurin, I mean, will have the best quarterback play he's had in his NFL career by far. Go back and listen to the Matt Harmon pod about Terry McLaurin's natural talent. This team is going to be in some higher scoring games, even though they have a really good defense because they have a really tough opposing quarterback schedule. So I want to bet on Terry McLaurin for sure if I miss on that Keenan C.D. Lamb tier at the beginning of the third round. Let's go to round four, Evan. These middle rounds, I don't really love round four and five this year, to be honest with you. I'm curious who you have in round four. Yeah, I have Tyler Lockett and going back to the the Seattle offense here. Now, his ADP has started to creep up in high stakes leagues. He was at wide receiver 22 when the main event, FFPC main event started. He's now up into the wide receiver 16, the wide receiver 20 range. But I still have him as one of the most undervalued players in all of fantasy. I'm number 12 overall among wideouts. He has finished as a top 15 wide receiver in three straight years. Again, the Seahawks have one of the most defined and narrowest target distributions with a uh, quarterback by one of the league's most efficient passers in Russell Wilson. Um, last year, Tyler Lockett, I know that people were, you know, upset with his ups and downs. And I get it. I just, I think he's going to be more consistent this year. I think that the offense itself is going to have more of an, a, a consistent identity over the course of the season. Whereas last year they were, you know, very pass heavy and then they really dropped down and, mm -hmm. um, he, but he still finished with career highs and targets and receptions. He had a hundred catches last year. And I know he's been around a while. He's still under 30 years old. Um, so I think that he is a safe wide receiver two pick with wide receiver one upside. And I mean, to me, very clear, Tyler Lockett was playing hurt at the end of last year. I mean, very, very obvious that he was playing hurt down the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight games of the year. My pick in round four is going to be Kyle Pitts. And I know this comes with a lot of risk and people are going to say rookie, rookie tight ends. It's too high. Round four is too high. I get that. If I miss on the top tier of Kelsey, Kittle and Waller. The only guy I think that actually has access to matching or beating those guys on a weekly basis is Kyle Pitts. And I think they're going to use Kyle Pitts all over the formation. They have Hayden Hurst to play in line a lot. They need more explosive ability than what they can get out of Russell Gage or Alameda Zacchaeus. I mean, they have to use Kyle Pitts in absolute ton. And so when I'm looking at the tight end position, it's like, man, if I don't get one of these top three, how can I compete with someone who does, well, it's either Kyle Pitts or it's just hope and pray with someone in the back end. We can get to some of those guys later, but it's really just hope and pray. Kyle Pitts to me in a, in a range where I don't want to take running back. I like Tyler Lockett plenty, but there aren't a ton of wide receivers that I love in this range unless one falls. I think D taking a detour onto tight end is fine here. Let's go to round five. I think it's another tough round and there's some guys creeping up in ADP big time. Who do you have in round five? So I'm going to go with two guys here. And one guy is at the, the beginning of the, the fifth round, um, maybe late fourth, but usually the beginning. And I, ha and I put him on uh, my undervalued list, and it's Mark Andrews. Um, you know, last year, Mike Leone, uh, who's really good at this. I know we, we you know, kind of manufacture a, a bit where we go back and forth. But, I mean, we agree like 90% of the time. Uh, but he uh, identified Mark Andrews as – you know, a candidate to jump in and, and become the number one overall fantasy tight end. That did not happen. But Mark Andrews still finishes a top four tight end in a down year. He was number six among tight ends in yards per route run in a year where he really wasn't efficient. And he still was a, among the, the, the most efficient uh, players relative to his position. Um, this year, Marquise Brown has not been able to practice for the entirety of training camp. Rashad Bateman is probably not going to be back until late September, early October after groin surgery. Just the, 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 the pathway has cleared. You know, the seas have parted for Mark Andrews to get back in, in there, be a target monster, be an air yard monster, be a red zone scoring position monster. And I think that people that were a little disappointed by Mark Andrews um, they, that has led to some recency bias and, and they've kind of overcorrected in the wrong direction. And Mark Andrews is now a value toward the end of the fifth round. I really like Jerry Judy and I really mm -hmm. like the development of the Broncos uh, deciding on Teddy Bridgewater as it pertains to Jerry Judy's outlook. I think that he can be an, a hundred catch guy. He, again, he's in a situation sort of like Keenan Allen 
where he's an, an elite route runner and he is going to come open and Teddy Bridgewater is going to see him come open and throw him the ball. Whereas Mark, uh, as Cortland Sutton, even before his uh, knee injury, Cortland Sutton was not a big time separator. And now coming off the knee injury, I think he's going to be even less of a separator early in the year until he becomes comfortable playing on that knee. So I think that Jerry Judy is just going to spend the season open. Um, that's that's the kind of player that he is. He had a lot of drops last year, and that you know drop numbers don't tend to carry over year to year. So I think we're going to see a lot more efficient season from him. His catch rate was forty six percent last season playing with Drew Locke. I think he's going to be up near six uh, in the sixties this year, and we're going to see him explode. Uh, and he's going to be a, a PPR uh, vacuum. Oh, man, I was getting Jerry Judy in round seven and eight. I I know in tough leagues now he's going in round five. I still think in home leagues you can get him in round six and maybe even a little bit later. But I absolutely love Jerry Judy. And I kind of wish that Drew Locke, I don't know, maybe I'm in the minority. I wish that Drew Locke had won the job for the aggression. But catch rate, I mean, my God, Bridgewater completed 84% of his passes in the preseason. I think that's one of the reasons he won the job. Jerry Judy, as Evan said, is going to be open a ton. And so catch rate for Jerry Judy is going to spike in a big, big way. Round five, I talked about taking detours. So we've spent so much time looking at, thinking about, researching the quarterback position in fantasy. It has changed so much. Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, and Lamar Jackson are unique and extremely hard to replicate in later rounds. And we'll get to some guys that we like in later rounds of the quarterback position. But man, if I can get Josh Allen somewhere in the middle or end of round five, I'm excited about it because week to week, not only is it so predictable how he's going to play this floor ceiling combo is absolutely outrageous when you combine buffalo's pass rate with how often he runs and how often he runs at the goal line i don't buy this rhetoric that he's going to be able to scale it back and not run as much at the goal line when the chips are down i think his number gets called at the goal line so still absolutely love josh allen just like we did last year last year we got josh allen around eight or so now we have to pay around five that's okay round six evan who do you got well, as another player that uh, appeared in my undervalued uh, list, and also we drafted uh, in our FFPC main event uh, draft the other night, and that's Tyler Boyd. Mm-hmm. Um, his high stakes ADP, it, it started out at wide receiver 40. It started to come up. It's up to wide receiver 30, but I have him as a top 25 PPR receiver. Um, if you go back to last season, Joe Burrow, uh, on passes from Joe Burrow, Tyler Boyd led the Bengals in targets catches and yards and I think that the Bengals continued inability to pass protect which I think is going to be especially evident early in the year when Joe Burrow is still kind of fighting through the confidence issues coming back from his ACL MCL uh, because I mean that that injury occurred in week 11 last year that did not happen early in the season it occurred in November Uh, So I think that he's going to probably start out a little bit slow. His chemistry will be a work in progress with the outside guys. I think he's going to find a lot of comfort throwing, you know, short, high percentage passes into the slot to Tyler Boyd. And Tyler Boyd is still really young. He's 26 years old. He's already got a 90 catch season on his resume. He's shown that he can collect a lot of volume and command a lot of targets and I think that he, this could be the year where we see him ascend into the 100, uh, 100 reception uh, sort of season. Yeah, I, and I thought we could get Tyler Boyd later. I had him actually as my pick in round eight, and Evan laughed at me and said, there's no way you're getting Tyler Boyd in round eight. And maybe that's true. But man, he started off really low in ADP also. But now he's rising. My pick for round six is actually someone on the same team who's falling. I am not buying all this negative hype around Jamar Chase. I mean, okay, the guy had hasn't played in a really long time, had some drops, you know, had some mental errors in camp. Flawless prospect is Jamar Chase. And he was going like end of round four for a while. Now I really think you might be able to get him in round six. People are taking T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd. I've seen go ahead of Jamar Chase right now. So a lot of negative press around Jamar Chase. I'd be buying the dip there. If he doesn't make it to round six, Chase Claypool for me, massively popping in the PSM and just a touch natural born touchdown scorer for sure. And so a lot of middling ADPs going on here, late five and in round six, I definitely like going wide receiver. Evan, let's go to round seven. What do you got? Yeah. And Raheem Mostert is a guy that in where he goes in drafts uh, can, can differ widely. 
Yeah. He can go in the seventh. He can go in the eighth. He can go in the ninth. I have him here in the seventh sort of to be safe. Um, I, I like what the 49ers have done with him this preseason, and that's kept him in bubble wrap. They haven't played him in preseason games. They've played Trey Sermon a lot. Uh, but they they know that Raheem Mostert is going to be a big part of their offense. They also know, you know, the limitations of Raheem Mostert. You go back to his college career, he was not a workhorse. When they've given him opportunities in the NFL to be a workhorse, he really hasn't been able to sustain it because he'll get nicked up. He, but he's such an explosive player. He's really the lightning to Trey Sermon's thunder. And I think that they're going to open the season with a, a two-way committee and it's going to be you know, Sermon in that bigger back role and Mostert as the, the, you know, the, the change of pace guy, but still getting 11 to 14 touches per game. And a guy that you can get in the seventh, eighth, ninth round, and you can open the season with him as your RB2 and mm-hmm. feel pretty good about it. Um, I just, I, I, and I, this is another offense where I really like betting on the offense as an entity. Um, I think, especially when Trey Lance gets in there, they're going to have maybe the best rushing attack in the entire NFL. I think they have a very good chance of at least being the best rushing attack in the NFC, good offensive line, you know, great coaching, great structure of the offense and a lot of explosive skill position players. And Raheem Mostert is one of the cheapest ones on the 49ers. Yep. Team preseason Raheem Mostert. Shout out to him. All right. I was going to say Odell Beckham here, but Evan told me there's no way I can get Odell Beckham in round seven anymore. So maybe I'll go with another guy that people are going to say maybe I can't get anymore. And that's Javante Williams in round seven. It's going to be tough to start the year. I think relying a ton on Javante Williams, but it's going to be extremely hard for the Broncos coaching staff to keep Javante off the field at the expense of Melvin Gordon, who was by most metrics, one of the worst running backs in the NFL last year. And so you get Javante Williams in there. He's going to make more people miss. Javante Williams is going to play really well in the pass game and at the goal line. I think by the end of the year, by the middle of the year, Javante Williams is going to be a really, really good asset. I know it's a little bit expensive, I think, in round six probably to go for Javante Williams when we have this uncertainty at the beginning of the year. But man, by the end of the year, I absolutely love having Javante Williams on my team. Round eight, Evan, who do you got? AJ Dillon, a guy that tonight we are going to be conducting a live draft with the real AJ Dillon. Let's see what his fantasy chops are like, man. I mean, this guy, he's going to be he's being put on the spot, you know, yeah. he's like 21 it, years old. I mean, and it's his but, first, uh, it's his first ever fantasy draft. Oh man. Uh, we're we're going to have to help him through it, but uh, he has, he has the 1.1. I hope he takes wow. AJ Dillon. Yeah. Oh gosh. I hope he does too. <laughs> um. No, but I mean, there's been some discussion about Kylan Hill potentially eating into AJ Dillon's role a little bit. If AJ, if Aaron Jones were to go down, I don't think I think that they would maintain a two back rotation. But AJ, but AJ Dillon would be just a touchdown monster, you know, potentially, and a guy that would probably get you know 16 to 20 carries a game, and then Kylan Hill would be you know in in the Jamal Williams role. Yeah. Um, but I think that AJ Dillon has a chance at standalone value. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, highly likely, uh, but I do know that there's a chance of it. And then if something were to happen to Aaron Jones, which Aaron Jones has had, you know, a history of knee problems. He's missed time in the past. Uh, A.J. Dillon would step in and become an every week RB1. So I, I like that. I think he's got a little bit of a floor and he's got a very, very high upside. And those are the kind of players that I like to draft, especially in the middle rounds. Yep, love it. I have so much AJ Dillon in best ball. It's crazy. Uh, my pick for round eight is going to be LaVisca Chenault. I think that Marvin Jones in the age model, I think that DJ Chark has been, I mean, broke his finger and already was kind of in the poor graces of the coaches. Travis Etienne goes down and I think Etienne was going to work kind of in the same part of the field that Chenault is going to work in. And so, yeah, Chenault's probably only going to play in three wide receiver sets. Expect the Jaguars to be in that set plenty. Want to bet on Chenault's talent and again my favorite wide receiver want to bet on their early season schedule which I know we've talked about plenty which is really soft and want to bet on Trevor Lawrence being good despite what's happened in the preseason so far and so I'll go Chenault in round eight let's go to round nine Evan who do you got there Round nine, I have, and with Tony Pollard, it's a very similar thinking to A.J. Dillon, but one advantage that Tony Pollard has over A.J. Dillon is there there is no guy like Kylan, Kylan Hill kind of eating at him from behind. And also, I think that whereas 
Aaron Jones is pretty clearly a better player, I think, than A.J. Dillon, at least at this stage of their careers. Tony Pollard, I think, is a better player than Ezekiel Elliott. That's a little bit scary when you are up there at the top and you're looking at Ezekiel Elliott and you're thinking in the back of your mind, his backup might be better than than this yeah. guy that I'm drafting. You're you know, betting and, on the and, coaches being dolts, yeah. Yeah. When you take um, Zeke, you're betting on the coaches being dolts, which I, I actually am okay with, but yeah. Yeah, but I, I still think that there's a chance uh, at some standalone value and the, the ceiling is just monstrous. I mean, Tony Pollard is an insta league winner if right. if he gets that lead role and and he's going to need an Ezekiel Elliott injury and Ezekiel Elliott has like very rarely been injured his entire in his entire football playing career uh, but if he does get that opportunity look out Tony Pollard I think you know like let's say we you know how we do the um the in-season rankings yeah um if if Tony Pollard were to jump into that lead role oh. or in, into that, that that Zeke role like Top Who five. would we rank? Yeah, I mean, would, yeah. you you would rank like McCaffrey ahead of him, and then maybe Alvin Kamara, and and maybe Dalvin Cook. I mean, that's the range that Tony Pollard would jump into. Yeah, uh, Evans referring to in our in season uh, content each week, we come up with a top three hundred for the rest of the year. Focus uh, looking ahead at you know not only just schedule or what's happened, but injuries and all that. And yeah. so, I mean, Tony Pollard would completely go berserk. Yeah, and by the way, that feature is is extremely valuable for trades, for waiver yeah. wire pickups. I mean, that's one of our better in-season features. Uh, round nine for me is going to be one that people are going to lose their mind on. I'm going to say Mikal Hardman. I, I know that people are down on him. I'm scared that he's more of Tyreek Hill's direct backup a little bit. I'm scared that he is, seems to be rarely on the same page with Patrick Mahomes. But man, they need playmaking talent. Like They're really not that deep at weaponry once we get past Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. Miko, they want him to be a thing still. Elite, elite speed with Patrick Mahomes' offense. We know they're going to be massive in pass rate over expectation. And so I'm still willing to bet on Miko, especially in round nine. I, his his default ranking, if you guys look in the article on the site, I mean, it is really low, like 130s, like 135 on ESPN uh, and sleeper and apps like that. So I think we can even get him later than round nine. It's possible. All right, three more rounds here we're going to do. Evan, let's go to round 10. Terrace Marshall. And you might be able to get Terrace Marshall later yep. in your home league. Um, but he has lit up the preseason. And I think that guys that have lit up the preseason like Terrace Marshall and Marquez Calloway, you know, people start to pick up on that, especially as we get, get closer and closer to the season and people start, you know, doing a little bit more research and, you know, who are the guys that have been balling out in preseason? The, these these players are appearing on, you know, sleeper lists and they, they do start to move up. So that mm-hmm. I, I'm being a little conservative here with Terrace Marshall, but you know, he's a guy that I, I want to get on my teams in the double, in the early double digit rounds, he's played so well in preseason. He's so familiar with the offense, the shower narrative with Joe Brady, Terrace Marshall played uh, under Joe Brady at LSU. Um, he, he's, he's been, he's been absolutely lighting up to the extent that, and I, I, I love Robbie Anderson this year as, as a pick, or I have loved him. And I've really warmed up to DJ Moore. Recently, I was a little bit lukewarm on him, but I, I, I started to really warm up to him. But Terrace Marshall is so, looks so good that I wonder, might he start to cut into DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson to some extent? Or, you know, or should, are we just, you know, should we start looking at Sam Darnold as, you know, a guy mm-hmm. that might, you know, come out the gates playing a lot better than he ever did for the Jets? Um, but I, I want Terrace Marshall on my team in the early double digit rounds. He's a baller. He, he absolutely should. He was a first round talent that uh, fell to the late second round due to the sort of nebulous injury concerns. Yeah. Love Terrace Marshall. I'd be shocked if, if in a home league you needed to use a round 10 pick to get him. But I agree with you. Like Terrace Marshall a lot. My round 10 pick is actually a number one wide receiver on a team and a rising athletic player, Michael Pittman. And I mean, You know, with the competition here, I don't have a lot of faith in T.Y. Hilton being healthy and effective. Paris Campbell, we will see on, has barely played in the last two years. Zach Pascal, I think, is a borderline NFL player. And Carson Wentz and Quentin Nelson are going to be back for week one. And so Michael Pittman's ADP took a big hit around those injuries. I don't think it's bounced back nearly enough. Michael Pittman, another rising young wide receiver. I want to bet on big time that Bible narrative with Carson Wentz. Very religious guy is Michael Pittman. Obviously, Carson Wentz 
a lot of criticism in Philadelphia for allegedly rumored to be favoring guys who he was going to Bible study with, hence the Bible narrative. All right, <laughs> round, round 11. We're getting to the end here again. We're only going to do 12 rounds. Round 11, Evan, who do you have? I have Jalen Hurts. And, yep. you know, I, I think that Jalen Hurts, I'm not totally sold on his ability to maintain the Eagles starting job for the duration of the season. But I am sold on his ability to score at a really high level in his three starts last year. Um, well, his three, uh, you know, largely completed games because they tanked in that that yeah. final game, uh, which would, you know, theoretically be a start. But we're, we're throwing that one out. He was the number three overall fantasy quarterback during his stint under st- center. He's a, a legit dual threat quarterback. And, and he's also and he's not an efficient passer, but he's willing to throw the ball downfield. So he's got some attributes that are just really fantasy friendly. I think the offensive line is going to kick butt. I think they're going to have a pretty good running game in Philadelphia. They're going to have to compensate for a defense that is still pretty strong up front, but gets worse and worse and worse considerably precipitously the further back you get. And that's not really the best way to build a defense in the NFL anymore. You, you kind of want to build back to front and be good in pass coverage. Um, and they're not going to be good in pass coverage, especially in the middle of the field. Um, and, and I think at cornerback, they're, they're really going to struggle too. They're going to give up a lot of points and um, they're going to have to compensate for that. And Jalen Hurts is going to have to play aggressively. And when I did my um, sort of back of the napkin um, uh, rankings of early season schedules, weeks one through six for, for all the quarterbacks in the league, I had uh, Sam Darnold and the Panthers as the easiest schedule in weeks one through six and the Eagles and Jalen Hurts as the second easiest. So I think he's going to start out hot, at least uh, from a box score standpoint. And that's really what we care about in fantasy. I love Jalen Hurts. We can get him this late. Uh, absolutely. And I do think that with the addition of Quez Watkins, who looks like he has a really good chance to open the year in three wide receiver sets, all of a sudden the Eagles weapons are actually pretty decent. I mean, you put Quez Watkins out there with Devontae Smith and Jalen Rager. You still have Ertz. You have Goddard. You have Miles Sanders, who plays well in the past game. I mean, they have some pretty good weapons for Jalen Hurts also. We know the rushing floor is going to be there. I was thinking the same, along the same lines as Evan in round 11. I have Justin Fields. I actually have come around on the thought that Justin Fields is going to run a ton more than Trey Lance this year. I know we talked about that on the last episode. And I also think there's, uh, you know, if they both don't start week one for whatever reason, I think Fields has a chance to get in there much sooner than Trey Lance, because as we talked about, the 49ers are going to play well out of the gate with their schedule. So, man, Justin Fields running for his life behind that offensive line, similar to Jalen Hurts, I think is going to rack up a ton, ton of rushing yards like Justin Fields. If I are, if I miss on that round five quarterback, I'm certainly waiting for this tier in round 11, Hurts, Lance, Justin Fields. Last round we are going to do round 12 ever we're getting into a bit of the flyer range in kind of standard leagues who do you have for round 12 yeah round 12 is Devonte parker and his adp right now is wide receiver 55 i have him as the wide receiver 40 and i've kind of noticed that all of the dolphins receivers are going fairly late in drafts and it's because you know there are a bunch of them they're not necessarily easy to separate um you know, Will Fuller is has been injured. He's just, he's not going to play in week one. Uh, Jalen Waddell has kind of been in and out of the lineup. Dev- Devontae Parker has missed time during training camp. People are still kind of on the fence about Tua, so I get it. But that's creating value opportunities for a guy like Devontae Parker, who, you know, is being valued at a wide receiver five, six level. And I think he'd be a, 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 f- a fine wide receiver four. He's a great wide receiver five pick. Uh, for your bench. I think that he's going to have a lot of usable weeks and mix in some spiked weeks. I think we're going to see a big step forward from Tua and Devontae Parker still in his prime when he stay when he's healthy, you know, which he hasn't been enough, but when he's healthy, I mean, he can absolutely score as a guy that, you, you know, you can rely on as a wide receiver too. And again, okay. being valued in the wide receiver five to six range. Um, I think that, you know, and we've been talking about this guy for months and, and his, his ADP hasn't moved. Yeah. Um, so I, I think he's a great value. Oh, yeah. I mean, 6'3", 215. I mean, still only 28 years old. I'm confused why he goes so late as well. 
a different type of player, a small player, a much younger player, I will go with in round 12, and that's Rondale Moore. I mean, Larry Fitzgerald saw five and a half targets per game in the horizontal raid in this kind of bubble screen, quick hitch roll, throw five and a half targets a game at Rondale Moore. He is going to do some serious, serious things with it. I also think he's going to get two to three jet sweeps or other plays like that per game. And so I think Rondale Moore has a chance to be the slot man in three wide receiver sets, leaving Christian Kirk and A.J. Green to be the ones rotating on the outside. If it plays out like that, Rondell Moore is going to look like an absolute screaming value in round 11 or round 12. Certainly want to bet on his athleticism. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed this round by round pod. For more players that we like and dislike, head to the site. We have tons of articles up. Evan Sleepers and Bus are up. My favorite flyers. My perfect draft, abuse and default rankings are all up right now, plus a ton, ton, ton more. If you have a draft this weekend, big good luck. Appreciate you guys listening through this whole off season. Crush the draft, stay focused, don't get too hammered. Enjoy the draft, but we're out here to win. We're actually out here to eviscerate the souls of our opponents. We can have fun another day. For Evan, for producer Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.